Welcome once again. This is Pastor John Carlo, Senior Pastor of Christian Pentecostal Church in Staten Island, New York. We have begun a study on the doctrine of angels, a very interesting subject which we're going to learn a lot about who these creatures are and what is their role in the kingdom of God. Now, first of all, we have to realize angels are not people. They're not human beings. They are spiritual beings. And you can see that in the word of God. If you go to Psalm 104.4 and Hebrews 1 and 7, you'll see many allusions to angels. And again, they are spiritual creatures. Some of them are invisible. The Bible tells us about that in Colossians 2 and 18, and even in Revelations 19. They're innumerable, as we said last week. No one has counted them. The Bible tells us there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands that God had created. We also see that, unfortunately, at one time, one of the major angels, an archangel by the name of Lucifer, decided to come against God. And a third of the angels followed him, and of course, they failed, and they became the, the demons, and Lucifer became the Satan, and of course, we know his story as well. We also see that angels have separate and individual personal personalities. For example, they have intelligence, right? We're going to see, the Bible talks about them being able to bring messages, and do things in Revelation. We see angels are going to play a great part in the end of time. They have will. They have will to get a job done, to finish what God has sent them to do. And of course, we know that they have emotion. When the Lord Jesus was born, we see this picture of the angels in heaven praising God for the fact that the Son of God had come to earth. They were ever, even in Adam's fall, because of Adam's fall, they became superior to men. Remember that Adam and Eve were created as perfect beings, and when they sinned, they dropped down in the scale of uh, people who had disobeyed God. In fact, we see that, as a matter of fact, they are stronger than men and women, in Psalms 103, it says, Bless the Lord, ye angels, his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. The Lord Jesus in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7, it says, The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And again, we're talking about the end times. We know one thing about angels that is a fact. They are smarter than men. They have a supernatural intelligence, and unfortunately, even the demons use that against the people of God. They are swifter than men. They, they might, we might say they are like Superman kind of, a, a kind of character. They're swifter than us, smarter than us, right? We find out in Daniel 9, when Daniel was praying, it says Gabriel, one of the archangels, is, comes to him and touches him and advises him that God's people were not going to be destroyed. We also see that they're inferior to God. Although God created them and, and Lucifer thought he could take over heaven, they are inferior to God. How do we know that? They're, om they're not omnipresent. They're not everywhere at the same time. It's like God's spirit is. Amen. They actually have to be in, in that particular place at a particular time. They're not omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. We know God is all-powerful. But angels have power, as we're going to see, but they're not omnipower, having all power. They're not omniscient, which is interesting. An omniscient being is someone who knows everything has all information, and we know the only one that is like that is God himself. If they were omniscient, they wouldn't have ended up following uh, Lucifer out of heaven. The Bible does tell us, though, that they were made in the image of God and created that way. 
they have personality, as we said. There is a certain holiness in the angels that stayed. We also see that there are certain characteristics in the angels that fell from grace, that decided to do that and follow Lucifer. <clears throat> but angels also have ranks, they have titles, like in the military. There's what is known as the archangels. These are the highest rank of angels, right? We talked about Gabriel so far, and even Lucifer was an archangel at one time. Then we see another archangel by the name of Michael. And his name means who is like God. Very powerful angel, but of course not God. We also see that Michael is mentioned by name at least four occasions in the, in the word of God. For example, in Daniel 10 and 13, he comes to help another angel, a lesser ranked angel, to get through to answer Daniel's prayer. We read in Daniel 12 and 11 that he, it says he will stand up for Israel during the tribulation period. So Michael has a very important job in the end time. He disputes with Satan, the Bible tells us, over the dead body of Moses in Jude 9. So even though he is not God, he is not afraid to dispute with Satan. And finally, the Bible says he fights against Satan in the heavenlies, in Revelations 12 and 7. Then we have another archangel by the name of Gabriel. And his name means Mighty One of God. He explains the vision of the ram and the goat in the, uh, to D uh, Daniel. It says in the Bible that he explains the 70 weeks to Daniel as well. He predicts the death, the death of John the Baptist and Zacharias in Luke 1 and 19. He predicts the birth of Jesus Christ. He brings the message to Mary and to Joseph, right? He also comes later on, remember when King Herod decides to kill all the babies in and around Bethlehem? He warns Joseph about the plot of Herod. And of course, Joseph listens and they go into Egypt for a time when he's told by the same archangel, stay there till I let you, I let you know when to come back. And in Matthew 2 and 19, it tells us after the death of Herod, he comes to Joseph, as he had said, and tells him, it, you can go back. The king is dead. In Luke 2, 9, Michael is, is the one, rather Gabriel is the one who announces the birth of Christ to the shepherds. In Luke 22, 43, he strengthens Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's praying in the last moments before he's arrested. In the same way, in Matthew 28, 2, remember Jesus was put into the, the uh, grave, which is a, like a, um, a cave, and a large stone is placed against it, weighing many tons. The Bible tells us that he rolls the stone back at Christ's resurrection. In Acts 5.19, we read where the apostles were put in prison. And he comes and frees them. He sends Philip into the desert in Gaza. When Philip had been at a, at a missions, as a missionary, as an evangelist, many people were getting saved. And the angel comes and tells him, leave here, go out into the desert of Gaza to meet a man, a eunuch, coming from another country. When Cornelius sends for Peter in Acts 10 and, th and 3, it is Gabriel who brings the message. He frees Peter from prison in Acts 12 and 7. When the doors open and so on, everybody walks out. He executes, now listen to this, here's an archangel. He executes the wicked Herod for blasphemy in Acts 12 and 23. He assures Paul on the deck of a sinking ship when Paul and he and the crew thought that they were going to die. Remember, Paul is being sent to Rome as a prisoner. And he is in the sea, and, and unfortunately a bad season at the time when these hurricanes come up, and they all think that the ship is going to sink. But he comes and tells Paul, 
It's not going to ship. It's not going to sink. It's not going to. Not one person's going to die. The ship will sink. The cargo will be lost, but no one will die. There's a beautiful story as they come ashore and what happens with Paul. He also is the one, this is a powerful, powerful position. You ready? 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. He will sound the trumpet at the rapture. The Bible says, and the trumpet shall sound, and all that are in Christ will be raised up. And here's the angel that will signify the beginning of this great time. The angels in heaven also break down not only by duties, but by groups. There is one group of angels called the cherubim. We read about them all the way back in, in Genesis 3.24. And it's interesting that these groups that we're about to talk about have very distinct character and very distinct looks. Again, for us, it doesn't really come easy to understand why, but one day in heaven we'll know exactly why they are the way they are, why they look the way they are. For example, with the cherubim angels, each of them has four faces, right? Not one, not two, but four. And we see the front face is as a man. The face on the right is as a lion. The face on the left is as an ox, and the face in back in his back is an eagle. And each of these cherubim angels have two pairs of wings. One pair spreads out from the middle of the back, and the other pair is used to power the body. And the Bible tells us that these wings, when they when they're used, make a, a, a noise like crashing upon the the seas, crashing upon the seashore. We also see they have legs, the legs of men. But their feet are cloven like the hoofs of, of a calf. And these clothed hoofs shine, uh, shine like burst burnished bronze brightly. They have four human heads, hands as we said, four heads, four hands, with one located under each wing. Now you might be asking me and asking yourself, why are they like this? I don't know. Put it in your list of things to ask when you get to heaven. And it says apparently they travel in groups of four. And their outstretched wings of each cherubim touches those of the remaining three. So it's almost like they're almost glued together, but they're not. Each one having three other companions. And they have specific duties. And listen to some of the things that they have accomplished or are, go or are going to accomplish in the future. They kept Adam from the tree of life. Remember God said, don't eat the fruit, tree, tree, from, fruit from that tree. And apparently they were guarding this particular tree with the knowledge of good and evil. But apparently Adam and Eve, in spite of that, were able to get to the tree and get themselves in a lot of trouble, right? You also see that two of these golden cherubims have constructed at God's command and placed either end on the tops of the ark and in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. So they became part of the temple or the, uh, I, almost, I don't want to say statues, but some type of picture of them. They appeared to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 1. And we see that even Satan, or Lucifer, prior to his fall, he was known as the chief cherub of the cherubim tribe. And apparently, I would assume many of the people who had, of the angels that had left, probably were part of this group. We'll stop here this week, and I want to give you too much. And next week, we're going to talk about another group called the Seraphim. So we have the Seraphim and the Seraphim. And they also have a very unique look and very unique duties, not only in the past, but in the present to come. So God bless you. And we're going to be talking also about people seeing angels at times and how angels have intervened in their life to either save their lives or to guide them or to keep them from harm. So God bless you and have a blessed day.